Okay, so um, let's continue from last time. In the last lecture, we talked about genomic and computational challenges in cancer immunology. Um, basically, you know, how to identify mutations in the tumors from whole exome sequencing, how, mutate, how to find out the, which mutated proteins are going to be presented on the cell surface. So this is by looking at the HLA or MHC type of each patient based on whole exome sequencing, and then use this net MHC to predict which of those mutated peptide will be presented on the cell surface, and also uh, potentially using the expression data to figure out whether that peptide is highly expressed in, in the cancer. And then um, also, um, in order to figure out what type of immune cell infiltrations are in the tumor, you can look at gene expression and use either single sample GSEA or uh, deconvolution approaches to figure out the different amount of immune cell infiltrations in the tumor. And, and then we can ask whether there are T cells or B cells recognizing the mutations. This is by looking at the T cell receptors and B cell receptors which can be a separate experiment, but also we uh, introduce this trust algorithm to identify the uh, immune infiltration receptor repertoire directly from RNA-seq, a map, a mapped read. Um, so now uh, let's consider the, the next questions. Uh, so what factors control T cell mediated killing, you know, whether the T cell will really kill the cancer cells? Um, so, first of all, you know, in order for T cell to actually uh, mediate the killing, we, we also want to know, you know, how to make T cell activation. Um, so there are genes in the, in, in the T cells that are, you know, activated. It, it, if you have immune checkpoint genes, such as PD-1 or CTLA-4, if they are high and also bound by the the ligand, or, uh, they, they will make the T cell inactive, then the T cell can't do the killing very well. They are also co-stimulatory or co-inhibitory uh, co molecules, which are also important. Um, yes, and also PD-1 and PDL1, so both are immune checkpoint genes. Um, they are important biomarkers for the current uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment. So for, for example, uh, so currently for PD-1, so Bristol Myers Squibb is the first company that made PD-1 um, available and FDA approved. <laughs> and later on, Merck also had a, a PD-1 antibody. And uh, initially, when they were tested in melanoma patients, um, they, they actually all work very well. But uh, Usually when a new drug was introduced, the first thing you test are patients who have failed all other drugs. They have no op other options than you try this new thing, right? So um, melanoma is not the main cancer type because you know, the, the, the occurrence of melanoma is not very high. The major market is lung cancer. And so when um, BMS and Merck are first testing their PD-1 antibody, in the um, lung cancer, they first try a patient who has failed chemotherapy, then they go to immunotherapy. Uh, this is called the second line treatment. So first line is still chemotherapy. And if they fail, they try immunotherapy. And so at that time, Merck decided to do the trial, but using pd one as a marker. So um, if pd one is high, then they will test uh, they will give the patient immunotherapy, but uh, BMS decided they do not want to have a, uh, a biomarker. And uh, when they did the trial, both passed the endpoint and both are effective. And so FDA approved both. However, in the clinic, when the doctor has to test a patient, um, if they have to use, you know, check whether pd one expression is high, it takes additional time and experiment, and right. So a lot of doctors just doesn't want to go through trouble. They just prescribe BMS uh, PD one, and so for a while, the the it's it's like about about one to four between Merck versus BMS in terms of market. And then in the next trial, um, they are testing the first line. If this is lung cancer metastatic, directly 
treating uh, with anti-PD-1 and comparing the effect with patient treating with chemotherapy. And so Merck still decide to use pd l one as their, as their um, biomarker, but Merck made a bet they did not want to use a biomarker. And uh, before <laughs> that trial completes all the patients that they did design, they, they decided to stop the trial because they were seeing that if they don't use a biomarker to select, actually the patient don't do better, they, they even do worse than the chemotherapy. <laughs> And so after that, uh, you, you probably remember Peng's talk in, in, in like, actually, they, BMS lost about $25 billion in our stock market. So this biomarker is actually very, very important. Um, and of course, for T cell to be activated, there are a lot of important things in transcription regulation and, and epigenetic regulation. And a lot of this is now being uh, developed using single cell approaches. Um, so, so we talk about single cell RNA seq. There is also single cell cytof, which is uh, basically um, you, you base, basically every cell goes through, gets smashed, and you can test about sixty different proteins on this cell. Um, but single cell RNA seq, you basically get expression level of a, a few thousand genes that you have already looked at earlier in this semester. So, for example, this is one very early study in 2017. They were looking at um, blood cells and lung. These are early, normal lung tissues, and then the, these are lung cancers, stage one lung tumors, um, and, and then you can use an antibody to sort all the different CD45 is antibody to sort all the lymphocytes, all the immune important cells. And then you can follow it by a single cell expression analysis. And you have done single cell expression in homework three, right? So um, you map the reads back to the genome, right? You, you get the expression index mm -hmm. matrix, a read count per, per gene, and then run principal component analysis to get the major uh, different components, then you can run this TSNI cluster to look at different clusters. And um, from this study, they could figure out, you know, which cluster is T cell, which cluster is uh, um, a CD8 or CD4 or macrophage or dendritic cells. And then they can also compare, for example, so these up and down, they're asking what is happening between a normal lung versus a early lung cancer? What are the immune cell changes in the tissue? Right, so you can look at those uh, situations. Um, sorry, I, I forgot to mention. Uh, so recently, there are also more studies on this. Um, for example, earlier this year, there are three cell papers published where patients undergo immunotherapy. You could look at the difference between a responder and non-responder. These are still uh, very few in terms of total patient number. But um, you can at least look at what are the single cell differences. Um, in the cancer cells, in the immune cells. Also, um, some of these studies also have pretreatment immune cells versus post-treatment immune cells. Because like a melanoma, sometimes it's, it's easier to get the patient uh, tumors. It's a, you can just scrape it out, right? So you can check this. And recently, there are also something called the neoadjuvant trials, which is, um, say, head and neck <laughs> cancer. If you have the tumor, that you can first take a little biopsy. So this is just on the cell surface, the, 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 the patient body. It's easy to just scrape out a piece of tissue and do the profile. And then pay, treat the patient with, say, one or two dose of uh, immunotherapy. Then um, go through the real surgery to remove the whole tissue. Hopefully that's the, the first one to two dose of immunotherapy already start to shrink the tumor. Then you can take the surgery, get the tumor, compare the expression of the before treatment and after treatment differences. So depending on the cancer type, you might be able to do this. I think for melanoma and head and neck cancers, these are easier. Whereas you know, for internal organs, they probably don't want to, to, those uh, samples to be taken out. It's a little harder to do. Um, uh, yes, Claire. Ah, okay. So, uh, so, so RNA-seq right now uh, in each single cell study, 
the maximum amount is like 10,000 cells. Most of the time you get like four or 5,000 cells. There you will get the expression of some genes, uh, whether or not you, you know these genes ahead of time, right? You, you definitely get more genes out, but you get fewer cells. With Cytoff, you can easily get uh, one to 200,000 cell events per cell. Um, you can also freeze the cells and it can still work. Um, but then you have to know the markers ahead of time and these has to have an antibody. So these are protein markers. So you need to have an antibody against whatever protein you're interested in. Um, and so if you are very interested in some cells, I think for every cell, you, you, you will not have like a really bad dropout. You will know that, you know, like whether this gene is expressed or not very well in each cell. Um, but then you're limited to 60 genes, roughly. Okay, so there are different, yeah, so but each of them at the end, you get a big matrix. Um, and a lot of the downstream analysis can be used for either Cytoff or RNA-seq. Okay. Yeah, so um, recently people are also starting to look at uh, T cell function, uh, looking at the chromatin changes. So um, there are two ways you can do this. Um, so this is a, a mouse model where you can have a, a tumor implanted into the, 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 the tumor and just look at like over time, how much, you know, like the tumor can be growing in the mice for five days, 14 days, you know, 28, 60 days. Initially, the immune system is going to try to re reject this, but over time, um, it will no longer reject, right? So you, you see what happens from the early to the late stage of the immune response. Um, yes, yeah, so there are other ways to do this. For example, if you have a, a viral infection uh, to the mouse, Initially, they might have a, a very acute immune response, but then if you give it a little virus for over time <laughs> after many, many days, you will also see this kind of a chronic immune response, which in some sense looks a little bit like the, the tumor that has grown for a very, very long time, like 68 days. Okay, so um, in, in this situation, um, you, they, they can take the tumor out these are coming from different mice then. Like uh, some you can take the mouse for five days, seven days, 14. So the, take the tumor out. And then you can do epigenetic profiles. So usually I think these, they sort the T cells. They sort out the T cells, then they do um, epigenetic profile. In this case, I think this is a taxic. A taxic is like a DNA's hypersensitivity. You get the whole collection of all the transcription factor binding site. Um, this is re related to homework five, right? So, so if you don't know what transcription factors are important, you can do a taxi. The nice thing about a taxi is even if you have like 5,000 cells or uh, like, yeah, usually you probably need a little bit more, but like 100,000 cells, you can get a very, very good profile. And so they are looking at, you know, um, what happens in the T cells from the normal to the, you know, like a, a tumor, implantation and also grows over time to look at what are the T cells in the tumors that are different. And so you can see here, um, initially, for example, this is one gene, this is uh, PD-1, PDCT-D1 is that the gene for actual for PD-1. And you can see in here, initially, uh, these are the peaks, but after <coughs> the T cells get activated. So do you guys know why T cell need to get exhausted or dysfunctional? Yes, yeah, Sam. So why do they get dysfunctional or exhausted? Yes, yeah, Sam. In some sense, your immune system wants to recognize the bad germs, right? But then um, if it continues to just proliferate and grow, eventually the T cell will grow too much and they will die. And so if, if over time you try, they can't wipe out this, this virus or something, you just kind of die down. Otherwise, so the body might have um, uh, adversarial um, <coughs> side effect. So the immune system know you have an immune boost and it doesn't, if it doesn't kill the thing, okay, you'll just try to live with it, right? And so, then 
I, I guess cancer cells kind of learn the mechanism to induce this in order to survive. But you can see, we know that in the tumors, when the T cells become dysfunctional, PD-1 expression is higher. And so you can see there are a lot of peaks now near the PD-1. And there's this new peak that really appeared later in, um, in time. There is another gene called the interferon gamma. This is the cytokine that's important for killing the cancer cells. And um, initially, it's, it's highly expressed, but when the T cells are more dysfunctional, um, then the interferon gamma expression is reduced. And so you can see here, initially, there, 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 there's this enhancer peak, but then over time, this peak is gone, right? So um, from this study, actually, scientists discovered that there is a early T cell dysfunction. You know, like once, as soon as the T cell get activated, there might be a little sense of trying to be a little, kind of shut it down a little bit. But if you wait for like 60 days, you get into a fixed T cell dysfunctional state where um, the epigenetic marks can tell you, or epigenetic status can tell you this T cell is, is in a very, very like late dysfunctional state. And um, in this particular study, they also tried to give the mouse this immunotherapy. And what they found is that um, the immune checkpoint inhibitors can reverse the very early state of T cell dysfunction, but it doesn't work very well when the, the T cells are in a late stage. It's so it's epigenetically programmed not to be able to activate those correct T cell activation genes anymore. And so those late or fixed T cell dysfunction states it's harder to be waken up at least by a single agent immunotherapy. And so you can see, you know, whether, even if the immune, uh, immunogenic <coughs> mutations are really present in a tumor, T cell may or may not get activated. And you can look at it from the, the T cell side, you can look at, you know, like from the expression side, from the epigenetic side to see what's going on. And so um, people are now doing more and more these type of studies. In some sense, single cell technology now, because there's a commercial solution from 10X Genomics, it's just like a shovel. Uh, so if you, if you have a shovel, you can just keep digging, right? You can get a tumor. Uh, whether the patient is treated or not treated with immunotherapy, you can just do a standard 10X genomic single cell RNA-seq. Um, and recently, actually, single cell attack seek data is also a technology is also available, and people are looking at this. In terms of immune cell infiltration, most people just try to get the expression signature from the single cell. Um, the, unfortunately, currently, to estimate the different immune cell infiltration level, single cell RNA seq has not been really the best approach, and this is because different immune cells and different and also cancer cells have a different, it's a different ability to be made into a single cell sequencing library. So for example, in the immune microenvironment, cancer cells are actually kind of vulnerable. Once you take it out and put them into single cell, a lot of them just die. And so, so um, if you estimate tumor purity based on single cell RNA-seq, they actually don't give you a correct estimate. And so this so far hasn't really been the best way to estimate immune cell infiltration. You can get some rough idea between like these, like in this case, the, the normal lung tissue and the <clears throat> lung tumors, but um, it's not considered a gold standard in terms of estimating immune cell infiltration, okay? Um, so what other cells can be activated to kill cancer cells? Um, there are several cancer uh, cell types. One is macrophage. Macrophage go the, the, the function of macrophage is to eat up something and like and then speed it up, right? So, um, however, there are two stage of macrophage, and they are um, they they have very different gene expression profiles. They also have different phenotypes. Um, so the M1 type of macrophage, you can see the, the you know the markers are different. The cell surface things are different. They are induced by different things. Usually, they are induced by uh, bacteria or type of you know infection. Um, and yeah, so basically, they are pro-inflammation. So it activates the macrophage to start killing, to start eat up the bad guys, right? So this is M1 macrophage is good. It can kill the tumors. However, um, the M2 type of macrophage is bad. It's induced by a different type of cytokine. Um, so 
M2 macrophage is kind of mostly for wound healing. You can imagine if you get a cut, right? Um, you can imagine M2 macrophage like a cell bandage to say, okay, I need to cover this up. So they, they accumulate near this region. And so what is outside, it doesn't matter, right? But because you don't want your T cells to keep killing the, the, the cells that are just going there to kind of help with fixing things. And so macrophage help just cover this up so that the regeneration can happen beneath and it won't get all inflamed on the, on the outside. And so it's a lot about you know, like tissue repair, wound healing, you know, grow back the, the blood vessels. So they actually are pro-tumor activities. Um, and so in the, in the tumor microenvironment, if you look at like single cell RNA-seq, you can tell like some tumors has more M, M1 and some tumors have M, more M2 and all the, a lot of the cancer cells learn to secrete like cytokines that will induce the M2 type of uh, uh, microenvironment, which will make the macrophage actually protect the tumor and the T cells can't get in anymore. So that's, uh, you can also see this from either tissue slides staining or from like single cell data. Um, and uh, recently in terms of immunotherapy, a lot of attention has been paid to look at the natural killer cell. Um, normally, natural killer cell is, uh, is considered innate response, but recently people think it probably also has some like important effect. Um, so natural killer uh, can, uh, can activate, and so sometimes there are also natural killer T cells. So these different immune cell types are kind of very complex. But in the, what are the things that really induce a natural killer cell? There are three things. Um, the first is, uh, so yeah, a lot of times in cancer cells, um, metabolism will change a lot and the cell is under a lot of stress. And so on the cell surface, you will see a lot of sugar glycosylation or glycoproteins that are different in normal versus tumor cells. And this can be recognized by the, the natural killer cells and they can induce the killing from the natural killer cell. In addition, um, Normally, all of our, uh, our uh, all of our cells have the MHC to present our peptide on the cell surface for natural killer cell to 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 or for T cells to examine. So you can imagine a very simple way to evade that is if there are mutations or or, or epigenetic changes that prevent the MHC from presenting onto the cell surface, right? But our body actually have a way. Um, natural killer cells. Uh, there is an inhibitory signal. If they can be bound by MHC, it will know that this is okay. So this MHC can inhibit NK cell. However, if you have a MHC mutation or epigenetic silence, if this MHC is not expressed on the cell surface, natural killer cell, this inhibitory molecule is no longer bound, then it can get activated. So if a normal cell, or not a normal cell, but if a cancer cell, is no longer expressing MHC1, natural killer cell will, will recognize this as, you know, this guy doesn't <laughs> have a passport in some sense. Then it will try to kill it. Um, yeah, so that's another way. Uh, a, a third way of uh, natural killer cell killing is, is uh, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or ADCC. So if, say, on the cancer cell surface, there are some unusual proteins or, or some lipids or some glyco, like a sugar molecules on the cell surface, they can be recognized by the antibodies. And what these antibodies, depending on the constant region, if they, for example, we mentioned IgG1 and IgG3 are important to recruit natural killer cells. So, so if the constant region of the antibody has IgG1 and 3, they, they, they can interact with a receptor called uh, CD16, and that will recruit the natural killer cells. And the natural killer cells can also secrete cytokines to kill the cancer cells. And so that's why recent, I think um, previously, because you know, uh, uh, PD1 and PDL1 are mostly working on T cells um, or blocking CD8 T cell interaction with, with uh, cancer. So um, most people are just focused on CD8 T cell, but I think recently people are starting to pay more attention to natural killer cells, uh, macrophage, and also the antibodies or B cells. Okay, so these 
um, I think people are learning a lot from also single cell type of studies.